welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Idausa, and I'm the founder of The Mimic Method and your R Sherpa for today. And um, what we're gonna be doing, mostly my goal in this webinar is to give you a sense of what this sound is first and foremost, but also the progression of how you get better and better at mastering it. And specifically you as an individual, finding out where you are in the progression and what drills you can be doing for yourself to go the next level up, okay? Um, so I'll be doing a bunch of exercises and drills. Um, I got some audio somewhere. Okay, great. So we're gonna jump into it. And um, for those of you who were here yesterday, I'll review those first few slides very quickly. Um, great, so basic principles of the mimic method for those of you who are new. Can you see my see my screen still? Yes. Um, you don't actually hold on. Let me just take out this extra monitor. All right, great. Basic principles of mimic method. The fundamental purpose of language is connection, so we can understand each other through heart and mind. And the fundamental experience of language is flow. That's a state of mind you enter into when things are flowing out of you and information is flowing into you and you kind of lose your sense of time and space. That is what's going on there, flow. And the fundamental reality of language is movement. Everything I'm doing right now fundamentally is just me moving parts of my body and producing sound effects with those movements, right? So the way we can loop all this together, you guys, the reason why you're here right now is because you want to connect with Spanish speakers in Mexico or Italians, you know, over here. And to do that, you wanna enter into conversation flow with individual speakers of that language. And the way you will achieve that is by learning how to move your mouth and your body and your face similar in the same ways that they do. That's the secret to entering into flow and connection with them. Now, in terms of this R movement that we're looking at, what makes the R movements in general across language so special? Well, they're one of the most common sounds found in any language, which means that there's many opportunities for you to either distort the length of speech by having an accented version or to disrupt it. So if you're making an attempt to do it right, but you get tongue tied, then that's a problem. In a single second, you're, you might do two or three different R sounds. So in a single minute, there might be, you know, 200 different R sounds going on. And that's 200 opportunities for you to get stuck and tongue tied. And of course they all build up on top of each other like a traffic jam. So fixing a single R pronunciation thing goes a very long way. Another reason why we confuse it is because the same letter R we use to symbolize many different movements, many different sounds. So the R in English is different from the R in Spanish. There's actually two R's in Spanish. In French, there's three different ones. All of these different sounds are being represented by a single symbol. So much of the um, mispronunciation I hear when I hear people speaking languages isn't because they can't make the movement, it's because they're confusing it in their heads because of the letter, right? So I just makes things more complicated for us. Um, finally, this R sound plays a similar function across the languages. It's typically the sound that we combine with other consonants and like put in between syllables. And for that reason, um, the way our, the brain set up with the different motor patterns and habits, uh, when you go to a new language and you hear an R sound, your brain might actually recognize it as the R from your own language because it shows up in the same place. Oh, I, I know, usually it's, it's this guy here, so I put that in there. And that's native interference, um, which once again, makes it even more complicated. So it's the most common sound and it's the most easily confused and, and interfered with sound in any language, particularly in Spanish. So that's what makes it so special from a pronunciation point of view. Now, if you do take the time to really sit down and figure out how do you move it, how do you get your muscle memory, how do you perfect and master this R sound, the benefits you will experience will you will be able to speak with less stuttering and less stopping, um, thus more flow and more grace. You will sound less like a foreigner and more like a native. You will be more attractive to natives. I don't just mean that in a romantic sense, but when we speak to people, the more they sound like us, the easier it is, the less work we have to do. 
Um, and especially since us English speakers, for the most part, people aren't too impressed by our accents, you know, as other cultures are. And um, so when we're able to actually pronounce it the same way they do, people will have a more positive response. That absence of a negative response and positive response will affect you, cause you to feel more confident in your own speaking, which creates a feedback loop because now you're more confident, you're not stuttering as much because you're more confident. And that confidence means you speak more, it means you learn faster, um, you have more fun while you do it. And then finally, we get to our ultimate goal with language, which is to be connected to actual human beings in that language, right? Um, so once again, I put all this here because we're gonna go really deep down into the nitty gritty detail. And you know, you might ask yourself like, oh, why am I spending so much time perfecting my tongue position at this very nuanced thing? Well, it's because all of this bubbles back up to the main challenge, which is being able to connect with people. So this is not a trivial thing that we're, we're working on here. Finally, the dimensions of movement mastery, no matter what sounds you're learning, um, there's five dimensions that you're going to be improving in. First is accuracy. If you're saying rrr when you should be saying rrr, then that's inaccurate. So we're trying to actually you know, hit the target and get the right movement. Once you have the right movement, you want to be able to make sure you can do that movement in all a variety of situations. Each situation that shows up in your target language you should be able to make that sound in accurately, right? And not only that, you should be able to do so consistency, you know, show of hands, how many people are able to do these Spanish R sounds, but sometimes it drops into something bad. Like you could do it sometimes, but not all the time. Who has that uh, issue? Yeah, right. So a lot of, some people just can't do it at all. Um, some can do it, but not all the time. So that's the consistency issue. Some can do it, but not in all the situations that are necessary. So once again, show of hands, who can do like the, the R sound with a vowel, but when you combine it with like a certain consonant, like a T or a D, that's when you have the most difficulty, like da -da, da -da. Does anyone have that situation? Yeah, cool. Uh, great, now you got variety, accuracy, consistency. Next thing up is speed. So maybe you can do it at a certain slowness, but once the speed picks up, then you start to drop your accuracy and drop your consistency again. Um, that is a um, speed question. So we're gonna train these things and get faster and faster and faster and faster so that we can flow at the same speed with the native speakers. And then finally, we have efficiency. Um, to produce a sound requires energy. The, mo the main energy here is our breath, our breath economy. and um, Usually when you learn a new sound, you tend to overspend your breath and, and, and you, know, you lose all your breath and you can't complete the sentence. So once you're able to get the sound and get it fast, you're gonna start to um, figure out how to make it more efficient, use less and less air, more elegant, more graceful, and then it just starts to flow out of you much more. So these are the dimensions we're looking at. I want you to keep this in your mind as you're doing this. Once again, my goal with this workshop is to get you from a place of oh, I can't do the sound and I'm terrible at it. And that's it to being like, yes, I don't have full mastery of this sound, but in th this specific situation that I'm not consistent um, or this specific situation that I wanna be faster and more efficient with my movement. So you can walk out of here with a very precise understanding of what the issue is and what you can do to improve it. Uh, great, so before I move on to actually talk about the sounds, are there any questions or anything you guys want me to address? Um, feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'll keep going. Just a quick question. Uh, do you know time frame for this workshop? Yes, this is uh, 90 minutes, so we're gonna end at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. Sound good? But feel free, if you have to leave or whatever, feel free to jump off whenever you need to. Uh, we'll just keep going. Cool. All right, great. So we did, this, those of you here yesterday, we did this. The problem, like I said, is we have to learn how to move like our native speakers. But part of the problem in language is that we can't really see or perceive the movements as clearly as we can in other movement activities. So for example, if you wanted to learn piano, you sit next to your piano teacher, you look at her fingers, and then you would mimic the movement of her fingers. Or a dance teacher, you would look at her feet, and then you'd move it, you mimic the movement of her feet. But for Spanish or Italian or Portuguese, um, 
is you can't really see what's going on. You can't really look at what's going on in the mouth. So you're kind of guessing based on what you hear and that won't be enough in most cases. So what we're gonna do here is shine a light into your mouth so you have a visualization in your mouth, but actually more important than that, um, I want you to have a kind of a, a mind's eye, motor sensory awareness of what's going on inside of your mouth. So what we're gonna do, I want everyone to keep yourself muted. Um, everyone repeat after me and say, da, 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 da. Okay, great. So what this da, da, da is, is we're taking the tip of our tongue and putting it up here to the gum line, what's called the alveolar ridge. If you look at my camera, you can see my tongue doing that. De, 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 de. All right, so that's, the, we're gonna map that. That's our tip of our tongue, de, de, de. Now I want everyone to say the J from John, J, 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 J. All right, now uh, this is using this point number three and coming up to just beyond alveolar ridge, yeah, you can see my mouth again. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, now just alternate between the D and the J and notice that movement. All right, and then map that to what you see here on the image. Tip of the tongue and then middle part of the tongue. Now, I want you to say, this is new from those of you from yesterday, to make the English R sound. R, 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 r. All right. Here we're using a deeper part of our body. We're actually kind of um, bending the whole tongue into this conical shape. And then we're saying, r, r, r. if you look at my camera, notice when I alternate between the R and the J, notice what my tongue looks like. R, yeah. Yeah. R, yeah. Yeah. Make sure you're yeah. staying on mute as well. So, yeah, 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 right? Um, cool. So, notice how for the, I'm actually back more with my tongue. Is it is a, is a backer part of my tongue? And this is a, yeah, yeah. And notice it's a different part of my tongue moving. So, it's kind of like your, your tongue has, um, it's a very shape, shape like an octopus, right? Cool. Now, finally, we'll go to the G sound. G, 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 g. This is the very back of my tongue that's being used. Da, 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 da. All right. So you can see the back of my tongue kind of retracting back like that. Um, those of you who are French speakers or are learning French, we did this yesterday that uh, the r sound. R, is being used the same back of the tongue. So our goal here is to whip these places, the d, j, r, g, we've, we've kind of mapped out these different parts of the tongue. Now there's one we, there's one we skipped here, which is point number two. I wanna come back to that right now. Um, in English, we say d, 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 with the tip of our tongue, d, 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 d. In Spanish and Portuguese and Italian and French, we actually don't use the tip of our tongue. We use the blade of our tongue. So this is my tip. And then um, if I can point to you, my blade is here, all right? It's just a little bit beyond it. So um, I want you to stick, um, just, just to get an exaggerated form of it, stick your tongue out and go, da. All right, just so you can get used to saying a D with a deeper part. Uh, but we're not going to go that far for now. We're going to say, uh, we're going to alternate between the English D and the Spanish D. So look at my tongue. It looks like this. Da, 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 da. All right, great. Now we're going to go through, uh, we're going to go through and work our way down each of these, um, each of these different positions. All right, so once again, repeat after me, tip of the tongue, duh. Then blade, duh. Then here, j. Then the R, r. And here, 
Good. Cool. Now we're gonna do the mindfulness thing. Um, we're going to, now when you're looking at my screen and you're trying to process what you're seeing, you're using meant cognitive resources to do that. So for this exercise, we're gonna close our eyes and that will free up attentional resources for us. And then I'm gonna guide you and guide you, tell you what to do with your tongue and also tell you what to do with your attention. And what we're doing here is we're gonna spend some time just discerning things inside of our mouth to increase a higher resolution motor sensory awareness of the inside of our mouth, which is gonna serve us in the later exercises and all your language and journeys, language learning journeys thereafter. Uh, so cool, anyone close your eyes? And then I want you to say the D, and then I want you to place the tip of your tongue at the D, but don't fully release to make a D. You're just putting your tongue there and keeping it pressed against your gum. All right, now with your tip of your tongue pressed against your gum, I want you to bring your attention to the feeling within your tongue of the gum touching your tongue. So see if you can, you can find it and try to separate that feeling from the feeling of your tongue touching your gum, right? So your gum has sensory sensation of the tongue touching it and your tongue has sensation of the gum touching it. See if you can separate those two in your mind. And it's trickier than it sounds. And you can kind of move your tip of your tongue around a little bit to try to find it. But once again, your goal is to see if you can hold two separate feelings in your head, separate them in your mind. Great, now apply pressure to it and then release. Apply pressure again, release. Now, before you apply pressure again, see if you can notice where the tension occurs in your tongue structure or the muscles for applying that pressure. Great. Now keep your tongue there. Now we're going to switch to the Spanish D blade of the tongue and try to keeping your tip of your tongue pressed against the gum, try to slide it down into your blade of your tongue and then slide it back into the tip and then slide it back in the blade and try to just get that movement back and forth, that rocking movement as slow as you can, slow and smooth as you can back and forth. While you do that, notice the sensations on your tongue. Notice when you're doing this, the blade, the tip will be on the teeth. maybe even past the teeth. Great, and then end and stop in the blade, keep it pressing the blade. Now we're gonna roll from the blade to the J position, but don't make the J, just roll into the J. And you need to check it with a J, go ahead. Yeah, and release it, but then put it back into the position, pressing your that part of your tongue against your uh, thing. Now, keeping your eyes closed, see if you can bring to mind the image that I had on my screen of that point number three, and see if you can kind of map that to where you are in your own mind right now. And back and forth now between that J and that Spanish D but keeping your tongue pressed. And a very subtle movement. Notice what the muscle difference is between those two. Next up, we're gonna move to the R. Just go straight to the R position. Don't make it, just hold your tongue in that tense R position as if you're saying, but you just have your tongue there. And then from here, 
alternate between the er and the j. But once again, don't make the sound, just move your tongue to that position. Notice the er, you're not making contact with the palate. You're just kind of putting it in that shape. And then to get to the j, you have to move a fronter part of your tongue toward the palate. Alternate a few more times. Okay, and then finally, we're gonna go from that er to a g. Don't make the g, just place the back of your tongue into the g position. Keep it there. Put pressure against it and release the pressure, but don't release the tongue and alternate between pressure and no pressure. While you do that, see if you can locate in your mind the muscles involved in making that pressure. All right, great. And then final thing, we're just gonna go back and forth between the tip of the tongue D and that G without making it. And while you do that, notice the amount of space between those two points, both on your tongue and in the roof of your mouth. Okay, that's good. You guys can open your eyes now. Cool, yeah, so I bet you haven't done a, a mouth meditation before. Uh, but the purpose of that, once again, um, well, actually I'll ask you guys, is anyone, what are your guys' experience with that? Did you have any surprising or noticing like, oh, what, what came up? Feel free to unmute yourself. I was a little confused. About what? Uh, when your explanation for between the uh, English D and the Spanish D, I wasn't exactly sure what you were, what you meant. I know that you use the flat of the tongue for the Spanish D, but I'm not sure where the flat is supposed to be located. Is it at the top of the ridge or is it down closer to the teeth so that your the tip of your tongue would be on the teeth? I'm not sure. Yeah, good question. So um, great. So once again, there's two, there's two things involved here. There's our tongue and the roof of our mouth. So um, in the in the English, the, we're just kind of um, our tongue is bent like this, and the tip is coming up to hit the ridge. So the only thing making contact is the tip of the tongue here. Um, for the Spanish one, we're moving point number two, a different muscle set, to the same place. But then the question that Robert asking is, okay, so what happens to our tip then? Um, your tip will then. Um, be either resting on your teeth or even sticking out past your teeth. So the whole tongue should be should be um, flush against the roof of the mouth. All right. And uh, does that answer your question, Robert? You good? All right. Cool. Um, great. Any other questions on that? Cool, all right, good. So once again, now we've done that and you've put some energy and time into it. Each time you do that kind of stuff, you decide to sit around doing nothing, just kind of like tongue around your mouth and see if you can, once again, build a more higher resolution map. Because the problem is if you're working on pronunciation and I say to someone, okay, move the back of your tongue. And then people say all kinds of weird, like, you know, magical terms and they're kind of like, oh no, I'm using my throat, my air connected to my, my wrist bone. And no one really knows what's going on there. And it's like saying random stuff. And it's because we don't see. But if you spend lots of time there, only reason I know this stuff is because I spent a lot of time figuring out. So I was just as confused as anybody else until I just got a mirror, looked at my mouth, like, oh, well, what do you know? You know, so um, so it was very useful to do that. And just once again, it, just like learning piano, learning dance, I did see my fingers, see my feet. Now you can see your tongue. Great. Now that we have that, let's move on to the the actual sound we care about here. So there are two sounds we're gonna be covering today. One is known as the alveolar tap or the alveolar flap, both names go. And the other is known as the alveolar trill. In the official International Phonetic Alphabet, IPA, 
they represent both of these with some version of, an, of a letter R. But as I mentioned to you guys here, the same letter causes lots of mental confusion. So I decided a long time ago that I'll just go into make up my own symbols for it, kind of a clean state, slate, because symbols have a powerful effect on the mind. If I put an R here, then it'll trigger in your mind, uh, you know, an association with point number four kind of contracting, like a muscle association. So to just avoid all that um, confusion, I replaced it with an ampersand, which no one has any motor sensory association to. Um, same thing for a plus sign for the trill, doesn't mean anything to somebody in their mouth. Um, but if you use our program, eventually this will get its own category in your head. So this is just a way of calling consonants. It's voice, just means our vocal cords are vibrating while we do it. It's um, alveolar, which means it's being made by blocking air at the alveolar ridge where we just spend our time with our duh, duh sound. And um, the difference between the two is one is a tap, which means the tongue is just um, flicking and tapping that point very quickly in a single instance, ra, 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 ra. as opposed to the trill, which is made um, by placing your tongue in a kind of relaxed position, guiding air over the top of it, and then it starts to vibrate on its own. That's a trill, okay? So it's a voiced alveolar trill and a voiced alveolar tap. And once again, our goal here today is to map out the progression for you in your target language and help you figure out where exactly you are going stuck. So um, we're gonna quickly go through all these levels and then um, I'm going to uh, have you guys write in the chat at the end of each kind of session um, where, you, where you rank your performance on those sounds. All right, it's very simple score. Zero is, I don't think I can do it at all. One is, uh, I think I'm doing it, not quite sure, or I am doing it, but like it's really weak and inconsistent. And uh, two is, yeah, I can do this, all right? I'm pretty confident I can do this, ver this uh, combo, all right? So what we have here is starting with the alveolar tap, which is the first one, we're putting in all the possible combinations you would find in Spanish, um, Italian, or Portuguese. And once again, most of you will be able to do some of these and not all of these. So your goal is to figure out which of these specific squares are you uh, running into problems. Okay, so I'm gonna go through one uh, row at a time. On mute, repeat after me and notice how you're doing. Ara. Ere, oro, uru, iri. All right, Let's do it one more time. Once again, anyone keep yourselves muted. Uh, do it one more time. Repeat after me. Ara, ere, oro. Uru, Iri. All right, now some of these may be, these are usually easier for people. These are more tricky people. And then this is usually the hardest one for people. The reason for that is because each of these vowels represent a different tongue position. So some of these tongue positions may be more tricky for you. So once again, pen and paper on your computer, write down the ones that are trickier for you so you can come back to it and, um, and practice them specifically. So let me know in the chat. Uh, how many twos are there? How many people who are very confident can pronounce all four of these uh, sounds? Where's my chat function? All right, Patty's got a two, a couple of twos here. All right, great. How about uh, ones? How many people can do it, but yeah. All right, great. So I got one half, <laughs> that's fine. All right, how many zeros? I people just don't think they can do it. You just can't get that sound at all. And no worries if you can't, I'm gonna tell you what to do if that's your case. No zeros? Okay, well good. Like most people can do that sound in the most basic form. That's good to know. All right, great. Let's move through the next ones. We kind of go through fast and then I'll get to the drills. 
Uh, great. Next one is when this shows up at the end after a vowel. Um, and it'll be a little bit trickier, but once again, repeat after me on mute. Ar. Er. Or. Ur. Ir. All right. Any zeros here? Anyone not able to do it? All right, cool. So Derek has issues there. Uh, cool. So we'll get to how to practice that later. Um, this one's trickier than the other two. So I think it'll be a few more uh, zeros or ones going on here. Um, if you have to me, ra, re, ro, ru, ri. Okay, what do you guys score on that? Zero, one, or two? Let me know in the chat. Yeah, so lower scores, it looks like. Yeah, so this one's a bit trickier, but a few people got it. Good. Now, moving on to level two, this is, so by the way, these are just kind of like disembodied random syllables here, um, but they capture everything. So is if you can do all of these, then that means you can do this sound every single time it shows up next to a vowel, right? So there's a million words that fall into these different categories. Next, we have non-alveolar consonants. So what that means is that uh, any consonant that's not used using this part of the tongue to articulate um, in combination. And the reason why I have it separated is because when you do use this part of the tongue, it's even more difficult to pronounce the sound. So we'll separate those out level two. I put these in categories because all three of these use the lips. This is the lip and the teeth, and this is the back of the tongue. So um, repeat after me. Arpa. Arba. Arma. Arfa. Arva. Arca. Arga. Cool. Now let me know in the chat, which of these uh, letters did you find um, most challenging? Was it the, the, the K, the F, the V, the M, PBM, someone had difficulty with? Cool, and then- um, How am I meant two... to be pronouncing yeah. this? How am I meant to be pronouncing this and sign? Because I'm not sure- oh, yeah, Sorry, so uh, I mentioned earlier the, um, the ampersand is just the symbol that we're using to represent that, that, that sound. Yeah. So in Spanish, it's just the letter R, but we're not using the R because it confuses people. Because you so didn't, use, didn't show us how to use that earlier, I thought. We did various things like D and Oh, J. so the, the D thing was just simply to look at our mouth. Now we're getting into this sound. We didn't do this sound in the beginning. So this uh, ra, ra, ra sound is what we're covering right now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through all of these, um, write down with the ones you're struggling to mimic and pronounce, uh, and then we'll go into more detail about how to-, how to And I'm just, I'm just sort of making up my own r, r, well, r sound, really. And I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah, that's fine. So that means you're at a zero then. If you're not, if you're not making the sound, that means you're zero, uh, but we'll come back to it and start to, and start to correct it. Sound good? Okay. All right, great. So moving on then, um, the, uh, oh yeah, some people are asking about the trill. So we're gonna get to the trill on the next page. Um, for some of these, you might notice yourself trilling. So if you're not able to do a non-trill, do a tap, and you only do a trill, that means you're at a zero, All right? So we wanna be able to master each of these separately. Um, now repeat after me again, pra, pra, bra. Bra, fra, fra, vra, vra, kra, kra, gra, gra. All right, cool. Now, once again, let me know in the chat which of these letters did you find most difficult? Well, which of these? consonants that you find most difficult to combine after. 
Charles says F and G, Fra, Gra. What else? Yeah, someone says they make the L sometimes. So um, one thing you might do, instead of making that S on, you're gonna be something, right? So you're either gonna be replacing it with an L, like you're saying, pla or fla or vla, um, or you're gonna be replacing it with a trill, like a fra and a vra, or you're gonna be doing that even worse in English R, fra, vra, pra, right? So unless you're getting a nice pra, pra, fra, vra, then you're gonna be at a zero or a one. Uh, great, cool. So once again, write down these guys for yourselves. What are the ones that you're struggling with? So you can focus your attention just on that. If you got something good, you shouldn't waste any time working on it anymore. All right, uh, cool. Now the final level, level three, is doing these with alveolar sounds. So these are gonna be even trickier because we're using the same part of the tongue we use to make the tap is also being used uh, to make the uh, other sounds or something similar. This right here is my own symbol as well. Again, this is basically the CH sound in English. Ch, ch, ch. Uh, I use this symbol though. So, repeat after me. Archa. Archa. Excuse me. Arsa. Arsa. Arna. Arna. This is, this, is, this is getting more difficult as you go along, by the way. Arla. Arla. Arta. Arta. Arda. Arda. All right, cool. Let me know your guys' scores on this one. Two means you got it good. One, sometimes zero, you're just flailing around. Yeah, so you see, notice how these are much lower because this is the highest level, All right? Great, cool. So now, once again, you should keep your scores on you and you can know what your thing is. If you're getting twos on the earlier ones then you don't need to worry about it, um, the ones you're getting ones and zeros on is where you're gonna wanna focus your energy. And notice once again, that this is ordered in, you know this is ordered properly by skill level because there's way more people getting zeros and ones now compared to before. Um, cool. Um, now, we'll just quickly run through the same thing for these trills. Um, trill is typically more difficult for people learning the language. So you're gonna get even lower scores here probably. Don't worry, we're gonna talk about how to fix that. But let's just quickly go through these things and you can um, and write down your scores for yourself so you know where you are, where you're standing. First, between, after, and before trills. I want to repeat after me. Ara. Erre. Oro. Uru. Iri. Ar. Er. Or. Ur. Ir. Ra. Re. Ro. Ru. Ri. All right, cool. Write your scores down. Lots of zeros here. Don't worry. Lots of people can't do the trill at all. I was not able to do a trill for most of my life. Um, so we're going to talk about how do you start to build up your trill. Um, some people were getting it. Great. Now, level two, putting it with a non-alveolar consonants. Arpa. Arba. Arma. Arfa. Arva. Arka, Arka, Pra, Bra, Fra, Vra, 
Gra. Gra. All right, should be lots of zeros on this one. Let me see what your scores are here. Anyone get any ones or twos? Okay, there's a one there. But uh, I don't think I got two here. By the way, um, I'm kind of covering Spanish and Italian. These things here, um, oh, I didn't mention before, maybe not, but the plus sign is my symbol for trill. Um, and the, the, these sounds here do not happen in Spanish. We always do an alveolar tap in this situation. However, in Italian, you would say pratico, right? You'd say pra, whereas in Spanish, you say pra, right? So if you can't do these and you're, you don't care about Italian, you're only doing Spanish, then don't worry about it too much. However, it is good to practice and master in all the possible situations. Uh, cool. Then um, final level three, boss mode, legendary status. Let's we'll see if we can do this. Archa. Arsa. Arna. Arla. Arta. Arda. Tra. This is the hardest I can't do this one that well. Dra. All right, great. I mean, let me see how many. All twos? Everyone get two there? All perfect scores? Oh, zeros. <laughs> yeah, great. So once again, this is a progression. We build our way up bit by bit. Now you guys know where you stand. So first mission accomplished, if you wrote these things down, this is all the possible ways you're gonna be using this sound in um, this sound or this sound in the Spanish language, in the Italian language. So instead of it being like, oh, I can't do the R, now you can say, well, I can do the R sometimes in these places, uh, but I can't do it here, 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 and here. Now you have your lists, your to-do lists of, of mastery. Um, oh, someone asked a question about like er, uh, Erche and stuff like that. Um, because I didn't want to just have too many tables going on here, the, what am I looking at? Notice I have all the vowels here, a, i, u, e, o. Um, these are all the basic vowels. They cover all the vowels in Spanish. However, if you're doing um, Portuguese, for example, there are other vowel sounds to do. Oh, so there are other vowel sounds to deal with. So keep that in mind. This is not all the possible possibilities to take that back. So for example, if you're doing Portuguese, you also need to be, you know, the nasal vowels, right? And um, Italian has all as well. Um, that being said, the question was asked about when we're doing the combos with um, consonants, I always just choose the vowel a, but of course I can have arpa, but I can also have erpe, orpo, urpu, irpi. Uh, but as long as you can get one of the vowels that you, and you have all the rest here, then you can do everything. So um, I hope that answers your question. So yeah, er che. Oh, someone's asking er, er che. Um, yeah, so that's er che is the same thing as archa. If you can do archa, then you can do er che. All right. Uh, cool. Now um, let's talk about how do we actually get these progressions going. Uh, cool, so level zero means that you're not able to make the sound, okay? So for those of you who are not able to make the alveolar tap, I think there's like one or two who are not able to do it. This is my prescription to you. First, when you're speaking the language or when you just kind of practice speaking by yourself, you wanna substitute Every time the letter R comes up, the alveolar tap comes up, or the chill for that matter, um, just so we have it there. You're gonna replace it with a nice tip of your tongue, D. Okay, so to show you what that looks like, um, let's just go to Wikipedia and just find some um, something in Spanish. All right, so I'm going to um, kind of read the sentence here, but each time the R comes up, I'm going to replace it with a D, an English D. Al igual que las versiones existentes de Wikipedia en otros 
idiomas, idiomas, right? So this one's a tricky one. So I'm saying, I take you take your time with it, but instead of saying otros, I'm saying ot dos, ot dos, ot dos, ot dos. Es una enciclopedia de contenido lib de, lib de, lib de, right? Um, inted, inted net, inted net. Anyone try that back home? Replace the R with the D. Inted net, inted net, inted net. Um, let's find another one. Ad ticulos, ad ticulos, ad ticulos. Notice when I say ad, tic, ad ticulos, it actually sounds like I'm saying articulos. It's very similar to actually me making the alveolar tap. So uh, for those of you who are having that situation, which you're likely doing instead, the worst thing you can do when you're speaking Spanish and trying to get it right is just fall into your English pattern of saying versiones or articulos. Um, it's way better for you to even just drop it entirely and say versiones, articulos. It's way better um, because if you recall back to what we did in the beginning, this er sound is a completely different part of the tongue, completely transforms the shape of your tongue. You know, for this, for this um, Spanish R, we want our, our tongue to be shaped like this. For the English R, it's shaped like this. So it's completely opposite. So you're better off just dropping that R entirely. Um, but to get into the habit of putting your tongue in the right position, replace it with the tip of the tongue D. Um, it goes a long way in shaping your mouth for the main event. Um, then second thing is we need to limber up our tongue. So everybody do this right now. Um, say the n, say n, 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 and try to see how fast you can make it go. So you're n, 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 consistency speed remember top consistency speed and then gradually increase it and what you can use to help yourself with that if you google metronome again faster so that makes it more interesting and more disciplined with using metronome. But what we're doing here is by doing it over and over and over again, um, we're building up our dexterity in our tongue. And then the real speed challenge is you start with the N and then you do with the tip of the tongue D, right? So once again, I start. I'll probably double it up. And what happens is if you keep doing it faster and faster and faster, once again, you need to figure out what your speed is that you get to a point where you lose accuracy and consistency. Get to the highest speed where you can maintain accuracy and consistency. Stay there for a minute and then gradually improve. What will eventually happen if you do it fast enough is that the D will just turn into a tap. Right, and now I have my I have my tap sound. Okay, and someone was asking about what that sound is. The alveolar tap, tip of the tongue, to the alveolar ridge, and you're flapping it. The D sound is where air comes out. We press the tongue there, and then air pressure builds up beyond that point. And then when I release my tongue, duh, it gets there. But in order for me to make a D, I need to first have time spent building up air behind it. Whereas in the tap, I don't have that time. So if I make my D faster and faster and faster, AKA I reduce the amount of time I'm holding air behind the tongue, 
then eventually by definition, I get into a flap, all right? I've done this with countless people. If you stay with it in a disciplined manner and keep doing your drills, set, you know, set 10 minutes a day just to work on this and make a habit of just kind of doing it whenever you remember, when you're walking around the house, like, you know, sweeping the floor or driving the car or whatever, then it'll just get better and better and better. And eventually you'll get your tap. And boom, once you have the tap, now you can come to level one, which is to perform all of these things in the vowel combination. So for those of you who were um, not able to uh, do, so the first thing you'll have is really ah, da, ah, da, da, da. If you weren't able to do it at the end here, um, what you're going to do is you're going to start with this and say ara, 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 and then try to shorten the length of the vowel each time around. So I have ara, 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 Make sense? So try that a few times by yourselves, starting along ara. Ara, 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 until it's completely gone. Um, so if you're performing the between version and then cut the second vowel shorter and shorter until there's nothing left. Same idea for the other one, uh, but we're gonna be cutting short at the beginning. So I have a long ara, 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 ara. Ra, 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 ra. And to understand what's happening there, um, in order for me to have that flap, I need to have a sufficient uh, breath of air to support it. And when you have a vowel, ah, uh, you have that air, ah, uh, ra. That's why between is easier. Um, but when I don't have a vowel, ra, then I have to time it, right? I have to time it. And if I'm too late, and I'm like, ra then I won't get it. If I'm too early, uh, you'll hear my vowel. So it's basically just a timing drill. So once again, this is a type of exercise where you're just fooling around and trying to notice your timing and then cut it shorter and shorter, closer to the, to the edge until you got it good. Um, great. Then um, next we have the, um, so great. So if you're able to do, and by the way, we mentioned earlier that um, some of these vowels are easier than others. So what you wanna do is first master your easiest vowel, which for most people is the ah. Make sure you master that one first. And, and if, you get all, if you get that one nice and good, then you can transfer it over into the next one. So you, it's all about focus here. If we do all these at once, it's too overwhelming. But if we, um, if we focus just on getting the ara, 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 then we are much more familiar with that movement and we can start putting other vowels around it. What people tend to struggle with most are the U and the E, and that's because the tongue positions here are a bit trickier, but you just have to experiment and, and get it to work. I uh, see so we have a question here. Any tips for the tra and tra? Yeah, we're gonna get to that, don't worry. Um, someone asking what's the difference between the ara and the ada? Um, so the question is, what's the difference between the alveolar tap and the D sound, which is called the alveolar stop? Once again, for the D, if you look at my mouth, I'm placing my tongue there and building up air pressure behind. Da, da, da. So the nature of that movement is that I'm releasing a pressure of air. Da. For the tap, ra, 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 ra. There's no buildup of air behind it. I'm just smacking it, right? So in essence, a tap is a really fast D, right? So fast that there's no time to, to um, capture air behind it, right? Uh, so that's why if you do a really fast D, it will naturally evolve and morph into an alveolar tap. Um, great. So now we have our level one. Level two is being able to Level two and three are being able to do it in combination with consonants. It's the same type of exercises you're gonna be doing here. Um, in the case of you struggling with a before and a review, a before is gonna be arpa, arba, arma, archa, arsa, 
arna, arta, all those kind of things. If you struggle with any of these combos from before, here's how you practice it. All right, and everyone follow along back home. We're going to um, stop at the beginning of the consonant. What do I mean by that? So this is just a dance movement with your tongue, right? I start with the ah, and then my tongue tip, my tongue comes up to the alveolar ridge. Ah, and then I move my lips to make a P. Ah, and then I release it. Ba. What we're gonna do is we're gonna stop. A P, for example, is made by pressing my lips together. Pa, and then releasing it. So there's a setup of pressing my lips and release. Press, release. You're gonna stop and on the press like this. Ar. So anybody do that. Ar. And you wanna end with that pressure. Ar. Ar. All right. Ar. And that's the movement you're practicing. And then once you have that, release it. Ar. Pa. Ar. Pa. Ar. Pa. All right. And if that's too fast, you can do it a bit slower. Ar, ar. And it's just a coordination thing. Because remember, your tongue and your lips are two separate parts of your body. Ar. So you're just trying to time it so that the lips close right before, right after you uh, do the R sound. Um, now, it's really good to practice without any vocalization. So instead of saying ar, I can just say, maybe see my screen and focus on it, just look at my face. What's that? All right, so I think it's something to say. All right, so look at my face again, my mouth. I'm not vocalizing at all. I'm just going. Doing a silent practice is extremely effective because you removed all the, all the audio stimulation and you're just doing the movement. And then you're, you're, you should end with a nice pressure suction at the end. All right, and then um, another example would be with the, uh, the F sound. Another example is the K sound. And once again, think about what's happening. This is the back of your tongue. So the tip of my tongue going, and then I place it for the K. See how fast my tongue moves there. And I can do it once again, silent. And once again, think of yourself like the dancer. You have to do lots of repetitions of the move. So just do a hundred reps, put a metronome on. Um, put a metronome on I can just literally set a timer for like two minutes and then do my reps like this. That's what fast, I do good. Right, so you find your speed, find your speed you're comfortable with, do a bunch of reps and then increase the speed. This is how you get better at the movement, right? This is, this is the process. It's the same process applied to all the sounds. All right, cool. So that's what we have a before. Now, when we have an after, uh, let me share my screen again. When we have an after, uh, all right, yeah. So um, the drill here then is, Insert, um, oh yeah, sorry, so I didn't finish the drill here. So we said stop at the beginning of the consonant and then pause and then release. And then you can kind of reduce the length of that pause until you've got it in the middle. So like, ar -ba, ar -ba, ar -ba, ar -ba, and then make it faster. Ar -ba, ar -ba, ar -ba, ar -ba, ar -ba, ar Actually, let's quickly review the T. That's the hardest one, the T and the D. Once again, look at my, um, this is why you, had to, you have to do the proper Spanish T and D, which is the blade of your tongue. Ta, da, 
Ta-da. Look at my silent preparation. Slow motion. Are. 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 That's the movement. Are. So in words like arte, I'm just doing that fast. Arte. Are. De. Are. De. All right. So you find your speed. Are. 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 Do a bunch of reps, then fall asleep. Let your brain do its magic. Problem solved the rest of your life. All right. Cool. Um, so that's how that works. Now for after, what we're going to do to practice the after one is we're going to insert this neutral. This is just the uh vowel. When I say neutral is like if I just opened my mouth and didn't do anything, I'd give this vowel. Uh, all right. And we're going to put this in between the consonant and the tap. So I have, um, imagine I have a pura, 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 pura. And you can practice without the P's or it's like ura, 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 ura. Pura, 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 pura. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna reduce the length of that vowel. Pura, 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 pura. Pra, 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 until eventually there's nothing there, All right? Same thing for the B. Fura, fura, fura. Kura, 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 right? So once again, you need to find precisely where you are in your progression. How was the shortest uh you can do? If you go too short, it'll sound like fur and then you'll get tripped up. So once you stumble, Train yourself not to, you know, whip yourself and you're a bad person, which is what everyone does to say, oh no, that just means that's where I am in the progression. Let me take one step back and do a hundred reps and then take two steps forward. Okay. Um, that's for that. I want to look at the harder ones as well. Same thing um, for the TRA and DRA someone was asking. Once again, you need to have your tongue in the right position for the T and the D. Tera. Tera. If I do the English R, tera, it won't work. It'll be too um, difficult because I'm, I'm basically stutter stepping in the same place. Um, the, the Spanish one is a different part of your tongue. Tera. 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 Tra, 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 tra. Another thing you need to pay attention to for those T's and D's is to make sure you have sufficient buildup of air behind, beyond, behind the tongue before you start. Tra, tra, right? And for the D, tra, 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 tra. Ta -da. Ta -da. All right, cool. Do you guys see now where the whole point here is that we can just find precisely where you are on the spectrum and then, you know, oh, I can do this. I want to do this. I just have to do this slightly faster. That's all it is, right? So if you can do each individual movement, but you can't do them together, together that's purely a question of speed, which means you just do a speed exercise of gradually increasing it, okay? Um, great. So that is the level two and level three. And um, so that's that's level two and level three for actually both the taps and the trills. Now we're going to talk about if you can't do a trill at all, how do you build up that trill? So first part, first answer to that question is if you're not able to do a trill, then I recommend focusing on getting your way up to level three on the tap, right? So you should be able to master this whole graph on a tap before you put too much energy into the trill. And the reason for that is because what stops people from the trill first and foremost is the lack of um, 
dexterity and limberness in the tongue. It needs to be very loose and relaxed. And if you never do the alveolar trill and your taps aren't that strong and you don't speak Spanish every day, then your tongue doesn't have that limberness. In fact, if you look at um, Spanish children, Spanish speaking children, the trill is the last sound they learn. It's the very last sound they learn. And what they tend to do is they tend to replace it with a ra. And then when they're like five, it'll start to come in. But it's because when they're five, they already did their, you know, 10,000 reps with the, with the tap. So you need to follow the children and go through that same progression and get that limberness in your tongue first. Uh, so if you can't do it, once again, just because you didn't do the repetitions to limber it up yet. So that's first thing. You want to get the level three on your tap and be patient with it. Then in the meantime, similar to how if you can't do the tap, you replace it with the tip of the tongue D sound. Da, da, da. If you can do the trill, you're going to replace the trill with a triple tap. Take as much time as you need with it. But what I mean by that is this. So for example, um, the word for dog and the word for the conjunctive butt is um, the only difference is the trill or a tap in Spanish. So pero means butt, perro means dog. But if I can't say perro, what I can say instead is say perero, perero. And if I did my drill earlier, going da, 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 my tongue can get really fast. You know, most of you might be able to do it at this speed right now. Da, 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 da. If you just keep building it up the speed, that's what I did. That's how I learned my drill. And I can do it really fast now. So what I did, I couldn't drill before when I first learned Spanish. So I cheated and I'm like, okay, let me just do like a triple tap as fast as I can. Si, porque mi perero está ahí, right? And then I say, perero. So I'm not chilling. I'm saying perero really fast. Um, so get your top speed and then do three of them. Perero, perero, uh, carreraril, right? And it's awkward, but once again, it's not a permanent fix. What we're doing is we're we're kind of forcing the brain to start to make the adjustment to, to make that sound. Then, um, the similar to with the tap, how we did a bunch of D's really quickly on the metronome. Um, to kind of limber up the tongue. Same thing. We're gonna be doing as fast as you can. Just put a timer in, take five minutes a day, and just do five minutes continuous of just your fastest tap, um, maintaining consistency and accuracy, of course. Um, and then once again, this is loosens your tongue up and you're catching up with the five-year-old and getting the repetitions you need for your tongue. Then the other, um, the other drill we're doing here is this. I'm going to walk you guys through it right here. Um, you're going to, everyone take the tip of your tongue, um, put it in that D position, uh, but hold it there lightly. Don't press it as you do for D. And then you're going to blow air over it like this. All right. And then what you're going to do is um, same position. I want you to slightly lower the tongue so it's hovering just beneath that point. So instead of it's so you still have a narrow ch channel you're forming that air can pass through with turbulence but you're not touching it you're just a little bit beneath it and then you want to push from your diaphragm to get a good gust of air and then now the final part of it is i want you to take a big breath of air but we're going to pulse little belly breaths into it so like this all right now some of you might just flicker into a trill which is the point um so you're you and you're going to just kind of experiment with different slight micro millimeter adjustments to your tongue being a little bit more forward a little bit hover it down um you're not necessarily looking for the trill you're just doing this to kind of familiarize your body 
with that sensation. However, if you keep doing it, you might stumble upon the trill and it will sound like, <sighs> right? So this trill is saying your tongue is slightly bit more forward, slightly bit lower. You just have to play around that space. Once again, it's a time question. Set a timer for five minutes and you're just being like, <sighs> Not necessarily with the goal of getting the trill, just with the goal of doing it and getting used to that thing, all right? Now, that was a voiceless activity. Now we're gonna do the same thing with our voice. Starting from the top, place your tongue in the D position, but very lightly touch the gum ridge and then put voiced air through like this. Uh, uh, uh. Now, same thing, hover it just beneath, maybe a little bit more towards your teeth and try it there. Gain just the lightest touch you possibly can and then do uh, bursts of air. Right, and then also when you do those gusts, start with your tongue down and bring it up. And once again, if you find that sweet spot, which is just a little bit more forward, a little bit more down, if you get enough pressure in the throat, you might catch a trill. But you know, unless your tongue's already limber enough, you 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 likely won't. So don't be too excited. All right, great. That is how you're going to be setting it up. And basically with the combination of practicing saying anything like pererero, pererero caririril, and then practicing over here, limbering it up, and then doing this and experimenting there. The combination of those three activities um, tends to produce a trill. Now, each of you might have idiosyncratic things you're doing that you don't realize, like maybe you're tensing the tongue and say, you know, I can't really tell that unless I'm working with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but um, for the general population, play around with these things and then a trill will emerge. Uh, and then to wrap it up, we'll go into questions. Just to finish it. Once you get the kindling on the trill, uh, typically you, um, Typically you start with a voiceless one and you want to get to the voice. Um, and once again, so you, you, you use this drill to kind of figure that out. And it's just a coordinating playing around until you catch it, until you find it. Once you get a little bit of a thing going, um, then you want to do a sustenato, which is basically um, sustain for as long as you can and increase the time. What do I mean by that? Get your phone timer out, and then you're just like <sighs> I can do one second. Let's see if I can push for two seconds. <sighs> Let's try three seconds. And if you keep building up, eventually you can get like a continuous sustained trill like this. And then with a the voice, it sounds like this. The more you can sustain it, the more efficiency you'll have with the movement. Sustenato drills are about practicing and improving your air economy, your air efficiency. Right? And then the other one is just a pulse staccato. Um, and that's even faster. So once again, we're, when you're pushing these limits, you're improving everything else, right? So 
if I go a little bit faster, my accuracy goes, my consistency goes, right? Um, you need to find out exactly where you are and just keep pushing it bit by bit. And then all that specific training on a specific sound will start to bubble up into your general speaking as well. Um, cool, and I think that's everything. Oh, and then this is just a, re a repetition of what we already covered for the tap. Uh, same deal here. Now you just need to integrate it into the actual syllables. So arra, erre, oro. If I can't do ar, then I do arra, and then make the ah shorter. Arra, 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 arra. Usually people can do that though. This one, ra. These are easier for people. Once you have the trill, these are pretty easy. Um, what's difficult is going to be these here. You want to release it. Brr, brr, fr, vr, kr, grr. It's the same exercise we did before to practice it. All right. So once again, guys, I showed you a lot of these. Uh, there's a bunch of information here, but um, the idea here is to find where you are in a progression. And I'll just quickly review this process that I just kind of outlined to you for the R. This is how I want you to think about learning any sound in any language. It's just a movement, right? So your first order of business is to feel the movement in your mouth, understand what's actually happening in there. Then once you have a deeper understanding and you can actually get the sound, then you need to be able to do the sound and all the possible combinations. Start with the vowels. You know, what are the vowels in your target language? Then there's only two, three possibilities in between, after, or before. Some of these options may not even exist in your language. Um, so you can even erase those possibilities out. Um, and then with the consonants, you know, before or after, some are gonna be more difficult than others based on the actual physiology of your mouth and what's actually being produced. So I want you guys to think more critically. We are language learners in the conventional world. We're very abstract, very left brain. We're kind of like, what's the conjugation of X, Y, Z? And we're trying to get you embodied into the ground level reality. This is the stuff you should know as a language learner. Forget prepositions, forget you know third person subjunctive blue perfect tense. That's very, very downstream to just like, what's my tongue doing when I'm speaking, right? There's a lingua. Lingua is a word for tongue. And yet no one knows what their tongue's doing. It's a funny, funny thing about our school system, right? So um, yeah, oh yeah, and then a fun thing I want to say real quick too is lots of psychology people have when they can't do full mastery, right? So they start on day one and they can't get it perfectly accurate and consistent in every variety of speed and efficiently. And then like, oh, I'm terrible at the language. It's like, no, that's not how movement works. You, you find out where you are, get basic accuracy first, now practice that in variety. Now just take time, be diligent until you get consistent and then gradually and slowly and patiently build your speed. And then as you do that, you'll start to figure out how you can get more efficient with it, right? So this approach is not just for the R and applies to everything. And I want you to, to take more ownership over your learning in this way. Uh, cool, so I'm gonna send you guys this recording um, tomorrow along with the French one for those of you yesterday, I, I just uploaded to YouTube and um, the um, slides as well will be attached. Um, any questions for the last uh, 10 minutes here? Someone asked, how many beats should a trill have in the word perro? Um, I mean, to be a trill, technically you just need minimum two taps, right? And it gets the job done. You know, um, in most cases, yeah, and, and most, it, there's only, there's very, in Spanish, there are very few minimal pairs, which is that there's going to be, if I don't say the R, then it's going to be a different meaning. Um, but in the context, people are going to know anyways. So really, the answer to your question is, when I'm speaking fast, I want to make my trill as fast as I can. That's why I do those metronome drills. So I can get a quick, short burst trills that I can put into my speech. Um, so I want to as fast as I can while still getting a trill to actually occur. Um, but if I'm commentating on a soccer game, I want it as long as possible. Right. So, you know, you want to practice both sides of the equation there. Sustinato and staccato. All right. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? And feel free to ask directly. You can unmute yourself. Uh, 
Um, someone asked about the course. Is this in it? Um, yes, we have basic stuff. Uh, I have, I have now after training one-on-one -on -one people with the R, I've, this is my first time just putting together the ultimate kind of training guide for everything. So um, once again, I'm gonna send you this video and you can go through it again and this lies and this should be everything you need from a basic point of view to progress your way up in the trail. Do I have live class like today's class? Uh, no, I'm considering doing another version of uh, Flow School. Uh, I know a few people here, Marjorie has done it. And um, it's a live training where you go through our, our, our premium program and um, I guide you. We have like, we have, uh, you know, office hours and discussions um, twice a week. And I'll probably do more of these type of thing. So I'm, I'm leaning more towards like live interaction versus just passive interaction with the, with the program. So yeah, stay tuned on the email list and uh, there'll be more information on like a, a proper full, full length program where we cover not just the R, but all the sounds in intonation, melody, mimicking in general, and as well conversation, both how do you get better at acquiring vocabulary and practicing and also psychology, getting better at um, confidence and whatnot. Uh, cool. Um, yes, yeah, so there will barely there will be right now there's nothing to purchase, but in um, stay tuned in the next weeks, I'll be emailing out about a uh, program. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Yes, Gary, I will send tomorrow's email. We'll have links to both the French one. For those of you who didn't come to the French one, or it's not French, it's, it's the back of the tongue. R -r -r -r, that sound. If you're interested in it, there'll be a um, hour and 15 minute YouTube video where I cover that as well. Uh, great, thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Karen. And if there are no more questions, we can end up here. Thank you, Gary. Yes, I definitely do. Wait, Adasa, I have a question. Yes. I sure. want to know, like sometimes I, I can do it, but not consistently. So I want mm -hmm. to know, how can I make sure I hit it every time? Is it through practicing the drills? Yeah, so the metronome is your best friend for consistency. Um, so you're, you know, so let's say you, you, you put on like a timer or something like that, and you, you put a metronome on at, at your comfortable speed. Mm -hmm. And let's say it's a trill, and I go, rr, 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 right? And then like, okay, every four or five, I sputter out, right? So then at the end of 60 seconds, you're like, how many times I sputter out? 12 times. Great, let's do another set. Let's see if I can bring it down to 10 times. Let's do another set. Now you just keep, once again, the key, the name to the game is just being very patient and diligent and gradual improvement. Um, if you stay with it, you will eventually get to a point where rr, 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 you're hitting bullseye every time. Okay. So metronome is very useful for making a disciplined uh, practice. Cool. Anything else? Many thanks, John. Yes, we all need practice, but once again, now we know exactly what to practice and what direction to go. So I hope that was useful to you guys. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, stay tuned if you want to join our, our live trainings in the future. And uh, have a Wonderful weekend. Bye.